pretend where you can only own what you can defend. Essence is large. They have the first round, all the voters who voted for their first choice. And the first choice is, um, they look at it and whoever comes in last out of all the candidates, they eliminate them. And they say, okay, these people, this person came in last, so they're eliminated. And it's like having a second round of voting and stuff that they've done it on the first round. And the, the ballots that they take that have been eliminated, they look at those people's second choice. But everyone else, because their candidate is still in, they still count their first choice in the second round of tab voting. It all stays the same. Um, because those people still want their first choice. Their first choice is still in the race. So they take the last place person's votes and they re-assign um, those votes to the second choice candidate. So I don't, so in this case, Jill Stein came in last of those four candidates. And so they would look at Jill Stein's votes, the people who voted for Jill Stein, and some of them may not have voted for next candidate, but if they did, they'll take their second, their second place votes. And they will reassign those. Some of those votes, well, many of those votes will probably go to Hillary Trump. Not everyone votes the same. And then they just keep doing that until it's done. If you get, if you get to, like, say, the next round, and you reassign, if someone voted for a second choice candidate who, if the third choice is someone who's since been eliminated, or a second choice is someone who's since been eliminated, then you um, would move to the next one that's still valid. So you would move to the next valid choice. But a lot of people worry that your second choice, um, that somehow this elects everyone's second choice. That's actually not accurate. It does not elect everyone's second choice. It, it, still, it still honors everyone's first choice. It's just that some first choices are eliminated. And so those second choices count. Um, so if, if you have a vote splitting scenario where you have, you know, a lot of people who feel one certain way, but there are two candidates who are very similar, and so their vote is split, then in that case, it's, you know, the second choice might mean a lot. Ranked choice voting is something that allows us to really express who we want, and it allows, in the end, people to not win with such low plurality numbers. Because um, right now, if you have many candidates, if you have more than, more than two, but also if you have multiple, like 12, like we have, and you don't have any ranked choice voting, someone could win with 10% of the vote, 11% of the vote, 20% of the vote, or even 45% of the vote, which is not especially the greatest either. And so by reassigning the votes, you're able to let the majority really express their will without being suppressed in the process. They can actually vote who they really want, but still have the majority outcome end up coming, coming about. <coughs> I know that was as clear as one of them. And once, and once you get to a majority, this stops, right? You don't keep going. Well, yeah, the reason being because um, it's mathematically impossible at that point for someone else to win. So there's no reason to keep going. I mean, we could keep going so that people can see how the outcome was, but it's mathematically impossible for someone else to win. Now, some people take, some people are afraid this is going to suddenly make third parties win, and the people who want don't want third parties to win. They might think that's really bad. Like this is an underhanded way to make third parties win. This is not an underhanded way to make third parties win, but what it is is it allows third parties to have a true chance, and it um, so that, for example. Uh, more people will step forward if they know that voters out there aren't going to be afraid to vote for them first choice. You'll have better candidates step forward that are alternatives. You'll have, and, and they will have a better chance, and if they do have a majority of the people, they will have a better chance. Uh, it's not going to be underhanded. If the majority still wants someone else, you know, whoever the majority wants is going to win, or at least the closest to the majority wants is going to win. Um, so I'm going to turn the time over, though, because I think we all came over here to hear about a bill and how we can build a movement, and it's very exciting because you know it's easy to just talk about ranked choice voting and how exciting it is, but when you have something really set in stone, a bill that you can actually tell people about, then it's a lot easier to build the movement. And so I want to introduce you to Representative Ellen Reed, who I met about three years ago, and she has done many things. She went to Vanderbilt and majored in microbiology and some other things. <laughs> <laughs> she got a master's later in some environmental 
socioeconomic anthropology. Yeah. <laughs> and she has been heavily involved in the uh, open democracy and the uh, New Hampshire Rebellion, as well as the Stamp Stampede. And she is now a legislator. She's been, she was elected in 2016, and she had her first session last year. This is her second year. And we're really glad to have her there and to be sponsoring this bill. Thank you. Um, my introduction to ranked choice voting came around the time I met Tiani, which is when New Hampshire Independent Voters was formed uh, about three years ago. Um, I was uh, registered as an unaffiliated, you know, independent uh, voter. When I ended up running for office, I chose to be a Democrat because even though anywhere between a third and a half of the population is independent, we know that an independent has a very hard time getting elected. So that kind of goes to the problem that we're trying to, to, to solve. Um, but I learned about ranked choice voting about that time, and um, the thing that stands out, because you know, for years as a voter, just as a voter, um, and then an activist, the problem was voting for the lesser of two evils. It was such a, you know, it's a heartbreaker to vote for someone who you really don't believe in, but God, you can't stand the other guy, you know? So you go for the person who's not as, you know, doesn't make you want to throw up as much. And, and it's, it's, it was just horrifying to, to believe so passionately in things and then not be able to vote for people who really stood for those things. And so when I learned about the system, ranked choice voting, it solves that problem. That's the thing to me. That, that makes it um, so much preferable to our current system, that um, it gets rid of voting for the lesser of two evils. It allows you to actually vote your conscience, which I think was the intent of our founders of this country. The bill is 1540. Um, I tried to, you know, it, we've never done, attempted to do ranked right choice voting in New Hampshire before, uh, so I tried to make it as simple as possible. I will, you know, I want all the support I can to get on this bill. Um, I will be honest, you know, we, we have a small chance of passing, a very small chance of passing this this year, because anything that changes things radically, it almost never passes the first time it gets introduced. So that doesn't mean that this is, uh, you know, an exercise in futility. We have to get this introduced, get the conversation started, educate the legislators, educate the public. Um, on this issue, so that they will see that they have an option. It's not, you know, it's not just this, the system we have is the system we have and there's all there is to it. We can change things. And it's not a bad thing. It's just that there are many races where someone loses because a third party candidate does get just that bit of percent of the vote that keeps them from winning. And then the other party wins. And they, dang it, they were supposed to win. In a way, it's kind of funny, right? But at the same time, you know, they should have a reason to say, hey, if we have ranked choice voting, then it's a little more fair, and then maybe if we lose, we know we lost fair and square, and if we win, we should have won, and the other people still get to have their voice. <coughs> so it can be good for everyone. Right, right. right. It allows you to vote your conscience because it gets rid of the spoiler effect, the spoiler effect that everyone's afraid of. So you no longer have to, to have the negative vote, you don't have to vote negatively against the other person, you don't have to vote in this kind of system of fear. You can actually vote for the person you believe in. Uh, the other thing that I love about it is something that was already touched on, but it allows, you know, low dollar candidates, independents, women, minorities, you name it, people who are otherwise overlooked by the system, to have an actual fair chance at running, to get their message out, say, hey, if you like me, vote for me. And, uh, and they have a fair shot. So, yes? I, I, I missed this. I don't understand why it hurts. Well, I mean, I think Tiani made a good point that, you know, well, what's, by, their rationale? what's their rationale for why? Because if you give other, they, they want to stay in power. I mean, the two party system forces right. the, the, the choice, the false choice that, hey, you better be with us because you don't want them, with whatever side you're on, whichever side you're on, duh, you definitely don't want those guys. And also, you know, our current system, as we've seen in the last several years, creates a lot of polarization. <laughs> with ranked choice voting in other systems probably as well, you don't get this kind of artificial polarization um, because now with the system that we have, 
we have to do everything we can on this side to differentiate, differentiate ourselves from the other guys. You know, those are the bad guys, we're the good guys, vote for us. So, you know, everything's about black and white, a dichotomy. Uh, with ranked choice voting, it's not about, you know, just two choices. So the only time you get an extremist is if the people actually want that, if it's an actual majority of the people who want that. So um, whatever your definition of extremist is. So that's why I think, it, you know, the two-party people would be afraid of it because it, it you know, empowers, you know, upstarts to, to run. That's why the Democratic Party was so upset with Bernie. Right. Exactly. Because exactly. it felt like they owned your vote, and you had to vote for Hillary because they owned your vote. Exactly, exactly. They need their, you know, if you're in power, you need the other, you know, kind of your villain. You need your foil to kind of scare people into coming to you. Um, and the same is true for being the other guys. So that's, you know, that's the power of the two-party system, and that's why it kind of locks us into this, this false choice. Um, are there Democrats and Republicans both that would like this? Yes. But in, in, in terms of people who are vested in the party and the success of the party itself, I'm not talking about politics, but the actual power of their party, I don't think those people will be receptive to this because this challenges the power of the two party system. The parties have become, the parties actually are corporations at this point in time. They are incorporated. And what they're selling is political power. And their currency is votes. There are a lot of people who are apathetic to voting because their vote doesn't count. And this allows their vote to count, though. This means even if you vote for the little guy, your vote actually does count, and you get to vote that. And you still get to, you know, I don't know what you would say. You still get to, to vote the way we currently vote. Um, but you get to vote for your conscience first. Right? Right. This could actually put power in people's hands as opposed exactly, to... Exactly, exactly. Right. But anytime you have one organization, I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's corporation, government, whatever, if you have one organization with all the power and all the cards, they're going to do everything they can to keep that power. And when you have only two parties that have a shot, which is what they want, then they have all the cards, they have all the power, they can do everything they can to keep that power. There is no perfect voting system. I'm just going to come out that you can that. study mathematically. There is no such thing as a perfect voting system. The reason I like ranked choice voting is from what I have read, from what I know, it most accurately reflects the will of the people in the most granular way. You know, it's the clearest picture that we can get of what people want. So, to, to your point, yes, just because um, other countries and cities um, use ranked choice of voting, it doesn't automatically mean it's the best system out of all the available systems. What it does mean is that it gives us the most data to mm -hmm. fix, to find problems and fix problems. Because I just read that they were studying how to, you know, increase human longevity by studying dogs. Dogs are not the most analogous animals to humans, but we have the most data on dogs because dogs get the most uh, veterinary care out of any other animal. So we had, and they use like the most similar drugs to what we use. So because we have that huge wealth of data, they're able to actually study human longevity better. It's the same situation. We have the most data on ranked choice voting aside from plurality voting. So that helps us, you know, know what the problems can be and how to deal with them. Um, I would say that if you go to a normal person in New Hampshire or anywhere and you say, hey, do you know ranked choice voting? They'll look at you like cross-eyed. They don't know what ranked choice voting is. Approval voting is even more obscure and more rare, and so to try to, and, and even, I think, more um, radical of a change from our current system. But with ranked choice voting, I kind of see it as like approval voting with more high definition, with more granular details, because you are voting for as many as you are okay with. You don't have to vote. You don't have to exhaust, you know, vote for every single candidate. You can stop wherever, if I didn't want Trump, I could have voted for every single other candidate except for Trump, right? or you know, every single candidate except for Hillary. Um, so you can do that, but you then, on top of saying these are the people I approve of, you then get to rank them, which gives it more of a high definition. All right. Well, yeah, I'll just want to thank Adam for coming. Um, the reason why we're switching to him is because he's had so much great success in Massachusetts, and he's going to share a little bit with us so that we can kind of figure out some of the good stuff they're doing so that we can do some of that same stuff. And, Pass ranked choice voting in New Hampshire. And I said, whatever happened to that guy? I don't remember his name, but like he really liked ranked choice voting. Because I could sense a passion, and I, I thought, well, he, we need him. He needs to do something. And she's like, oh my gosh, he's like doing all this stuff on ranked choice voting. He's having all this success. And anyway, so it's really great. So I, he's going to share a little bit about it because it's exciting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm a software engineer by trade. I created a really cool tool, this database, that folks may have seen on the NHPR website. Listen to NHPR, anybody? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Betsy Gardella of NHPR was really interested in this. They have a state of democracy series. And so they took this technology, and now you guys have 35, 40, 45 years of history back to 1970 through today and going forward of every election reported to the state. And it's this data that we can use to really analyze the health of our civic life and elections in New Hampshire. And so we've done this to create a wonderful report in Massachusetts called Majority Overrule, which are instances where there are spoilers and vote splitting happening. So we can prove the case with real elections, and you can do the same here. And Tom, when we met last year in Massachusetts, and that is uh, get mired in uh, fine points of the technicals or something. Raise your hand if you're here to pass rank choice vote. Okay. So we already agree on that, maybe except for one or two people who will remain nameless. <laughs> we may not get this passed anyway. this year, but this is a huge organizing tool, and it's a tool to get everything that Adam just said done. So we, we talk about like, okay, do we want to work on this actual bill or do we want to like build capacity and, and reach out to people? We, we can use the bill to build that capacity. Anyone who's interested in coming out and, and expressing support for that bill, I would love for you to turn out. But more important than that is what Adam was talking about is, yeah, you can go and say, yes, please support this bill. This is why I believe in this bill. But also you can use that and go, hey, don't you slight rate choice voting? We have a bill. There's a hearing on this day, don't you want to help support it? And that's how we grow the support because exactly what Adam just said, change happens from where? The bottom up. So we're not going to really get change in the top unless we have a huge groundswell of people who actually want to change things in the bottom. It will go to the floor no matter what the committee's recommendation is. New Hampshire is unusual in that even if the committee says that the bill is you know, complete bonkers and we don't like it, it still gets a floor vote. So then we will have that opportunity too, when it gets to the floor, to organize it on that level and reach out to people and go, hey, this, this bill is going to go for a floor vote. Contact your legislature, uh, legislator, um, you know, sign up. Let's, you know, that's how we organize. So, so that's the basic process. We're going to have a hearing in the coming weeks, possibly a couple months, and then it will go to the floor for a vote. If by some miracle it passes the House, then it's going to go to the Senate and the whole thing starts over again. But um, let's just focus on the house for now. That's that's basically the timeline we're looking at. No matter what, everything will be done by May. Yeah. I'm gonna make a few observations. Just my own. We're on an island of society in an ocean of nature where violence lives with poverty. Hope is their neighbor. See, there's a disconnect. We think this planet owes us something. Actually believing to serve us is its only function. Our attitude towards it is too insane. Fools in pain, residing on a target in a shooting range. What happens when we lose these comfortable conveniences and fools can no longer live off the substance of the geniuses? Your vaginas and your penises. Both the hairless apes, your frivolous differences are meaningless. You speak of danger and don't even know how safe you are. Acting like a mass extinction cares about what race you are. Society coddles and lies for what's best. Nature arrives wearing the disguise of your death. We hit the lotto in a universe uniquely hostile. While the attempted separation leaves the species hollow. The subtle conflicts of the ages are problems we inherited from ancients unforeseen. And when the battle causes anguish, it's all the society versus nature underneath. We love the comforts of community, but still treat the members amongst it brutally. They call for peace. There doesn't have to be this friction. Should we obtain balance, we'll reach the mythic bonnet peak. Grotesque areas where rest becomes where enough is perilous. Nature isn't supposed to be fair or just. You got that confused with society. The lies of piety, old sobriety, the notion you're supposed to hire me. A tree of life in a forest of death upon a leaf that employs the duress. On a planetoid orbit in death, what you expect from the killing game? The lion is showed up at the same time that your feelings came. Simple and plain, survival of the fittest ingrained to be retained in the primitive's brain. Your weakness will get weeded, even if you think it's better off to be conceited. It's undefeated. 
More confirms than the internet. It'll kill a vet like a sniper hits a simple silhouette. So imagine what it does to the clueless, the unprepared and scared ones who are truly foolish. The subtle conflicts of the ages are problems we inherited from ancients, unforeseen. And when the battle causes anguish, it's all the society versus nature underneath. We love the comforts of community, but still treat the members amongst it brutally, they call for peace. There doesn't have to be this friction, should we obtain balance, we'll reach the mythic bonnet peak. It's like it was. It allows you to sort of be transported back in time. That's the sort of thing I like my grandkids to be able to do, is to be able to go to the same place I went, be able to see virtually what I saw. Nature in the interim, society in the interval, maximum escapism, sobriety is the minimal. Intoxicated from the hubris, overcomplicate our simple world as we misuse it. Society's a nuisance, trying to sell a game of rules and pretend, where you can only own what you can defend. Essence is large, the fact is you are small. Nature plays the referee, you argue in the calls. Intelligence lives while ignorance is targeted In a realm where you only have your will and wits to bargain with Part of this is the cognitive dissonance We experience knowing we're born with death sentences We're less interested in reconnecting, disrespected Until it's about to kill us to teach a lesson So lost in age we dismiss it And forget that our place within is uniquely intrinsic the subtle conflicts of the ages are problems we inherited from ancients unforeseen. And when the battle causes anguish, it's all the society versus nature underneath. We love the comforts of community, but still treat the members amongst it brutally, they call for peace. There doesn't have to be this friction, should we obtain balance, we'll reach the mythic bonnet peak.